Good evening. A few nights ago, I used my 15-inch telescope to have a look at a strange object in the constellation of Virgo, the Virgin. You can find Virgo easily enough. You simply follow round the tail of the Great Bear, or the handle of the plough, if you like, bypass the brilliant orange star Arcturus and Boetes, and then come down to Spica, the leading star in Virgo. And as a matter of fact, the planet Saturn also is in Virgo at the moment, and I did pause to have a look at that and make a drawing of it, because in my view at least, Saturn is the loveliest object in the entire sky. But on that occasion, I wasn't concerned with Saturn. I was concerned with something much less spectacular. It's called 3C273, and it looks very innocent indeed. It looks like nothing more than a faint star. But in fact, 3C273 is not a star at all. It's much more dramatic. It is a quasar. The story of quasars really began in the early 1960s um, with a, a catalogue of radio sources in the sky drawn up at Cambridge. It was their third catalogue, uh, hence the designation 3C. It was already known that there are plenty of radio sources in the sky, but they don't come from bright stars such as Arcturus and Spica. Some of them came from apparently blank areas. Others, of course, were supernova remnants, exploded stars, of which much the most famous is the Crab Nebula in Taurus, which I'm afraid you won't see at the moment because it's too near the sun. It doesn't come around until the autumn. But in those days, radio telescopes gave poor resolution. So if you had two or three radio sources close together, uh, you couldn't tell one from the other. And that was very much of a problem. But then we had a stroke of luck. 3C273 happens to lie in a region of the sky where it can be periodically hidden or occulted by the moon. And of course, as soon as the moon passes over the radio source, then the radio waves are cut off. And since you know where the moon is at that particular moment, you also know the position of the radio source. And that was done. And uh, when the area of the sky lo was looked at, it was found that 3C273 coincided in position with what looked like a faint bluish star. But was it a star? And this is where I hand over to Dr. John Beckman of Queen Mary College. Welcome, John. It's nice to be here, Patrick, to talk about the discovery of 3C273 by the uh, group in Australia of Hazard, Mackie and Shimmins using the 210-foot dish radio telescope at Parkes. To see exactly how they did it, one needs to remember that the radio source doesn't emit particles, it emits waves, mm -hmm. so that when the occultation occurs by the moon, the signal doesn't drop off sharply, it wobbles and then drops off, uh, and then, of course, there is no signal until the source reappears, then you get exactly the opposite, a sort of upward wobble. And to find exactly where 3C273 was, they had to find exactly the time at which the moon revealed half the signal. And at that point, at that time, they could tell exactly where the source was to within a few arc seconds. Yes. They gave the star, which was at that position, uh, they gave the coordinates of the star to Martin Schmidt at the 200-inch telescope at Palomar and he took a spectrum of it. And it was then that astonishing things began to occur because the spectrum was very unusual in that it showed some broad, bright emission lines tremendously shifted to the red. Now, such a big redshift normally means very high velocity. And in this case, it was extraordinarily high, 40,000 kilometers per second. And if you believe that the velocity goes with distance as it does in uh, the universe as a whole, in cosmological terms. That would mean that the object was 850 megaparsecs away, two and a half thousand million light years away. Colossal. Very, very far away. And therefore, in order for us to be able to see it at all, the object had to be tremendously powerful. And when more of these quasars were found, they turned out to be even further away, and therefore even more powerful. Probably uh, several hundreds of times as powerful as ordinary galaxies. Perhaps yet more remarkable, they were found to vary, and to vary with periods which were rather short, hours or days. Now, anything object which can vary in a period of days can't be any bigger than a few light days across. And that means uh, that you have an object which is hundreds of times as powerful as a galaxy, but compacted into a size, that of a solar system. This indeed is an extraordinary object so extraordinary that there were many theoreticians who at the first rather reluctantly 
Uh, they were reluctant to believe at all that it was at cosmological distances. They thought the redshifts must be due to something else. Well, I'm not surprised at that. But after all, the redshifts are puzzling, aren't they? The redshifts uh, of uh, quasars certainly have been puzzling. Not only are they very large, but they uh, seem to be very confusing. When you look at the spectrum of an ordinary galaxy, it delivers a single message about its speed. All the spectral lines register the same redshift, the same speed. In the case of a quasar, the emission lines, the bright broad lines, did register uh, a particular speed. But superposed on the spectrum, there were also narrow lines, very fine absorption lines. And these seem to register not only a different speed, but lots and lots of different apparent speeds. In fact, the absorption lines were in a great jumble. No one could tell what they were. Now, therefore, the conclusion seemed to be uh, that the quasars uh, didn't have a single speed, or no one knew what the conclusion was. But more recently, work by uh, particularly Boxenberg and Sargent and their co-workers have seemed to establish that the absorption lines are not actually due to the quasar at all. They are due instead to intergalactic clouds between us and the quasar. So that the bright lines are due to the quasar, and they show a particular velocity. And each intergalactic cloud shows a particular set of dark lines, of absorption lines. Each set belongs to a different cloud. And therefore, when you see the whole spectrum all together, the jumble is explained as being due to lots of different clouds with lots of different velocities. Not so puzzling at all. Yes, I can understand that. After all, it did make the spectrum of quasars very, very confusing, and it took a lot of working out. But now, what about the radio emissions and quasars? After all, that's how they were first detected. It is how they were first detected, but perhaps not generally appreciated uh, that rather few quasars actually do show radio emission, and that is not the way nowadays that most of them are found. The way to look for quasars is by using uh, a plate Schmidt plate, a plate from a telescope which has a very wide field, such as the uh, United Kingdom Schmidt, uh, actually also in Australia. Uh, and each plate is searched carefully for blue objects. Not all of those are quasars, but some of them may well be. And each suspect, each candidate, is looked at spectroscopically. And of course, those which show large redshifts turn out to be quasars. Yeah. A rather amusing incident uh, uh, turned up quite recently when uh, a student uh, working at the Queen Mary College and doing a little computer project uh, plotted all the quasars in the Hewitt and Burbage 1980 catalogue, where there are nearly 1,900 objects, and plotted them in this plot on the sky. And to his surprise, uh, he found what looked to be two intense patches uh, of quasars quickly dismissing the supposition that quasars actually occur in little square patches on the sky, he realized that, of course, the reason was that these were the first two Schmidt plates that had actually been analyzed in this way. When all the rest of the sky is covered in Schmidt plates, the whole of the sky will be covered in detected quasars with, with a similar density. And that density is well over 100 per field. That's well over 100 per six degrees square. Uh, incidentally, the, there is also a, a lack of quasars near the dotted line representing the plane of our galaxy. And that's because there's a lot of dust in the plane of our galaxy which obscures them, not that they aren't there in that patch. Yes, certainly. Well, we've been talking about quasars and say they look very like stars, but some of them do have these curious jets coming out of them. Yes, many quasars have jets when photographed optically. This is 3C273 itself and shows a, a classic example. And more recently, uh, radio observers have also detected jets using instruments such as this magnificent, very large array, multi-telescope array uh, in New Mexico, uh, and also very long baseline interferometry, which is the use of telescopes on different continents combined to give very, very high angular resolution yes. on the sky. And the jets in the optical and in the radio are lined up one with another geometrically. And the theoretical model which explains this phenomenon uh, says that if we happen to lie in the right direction compared to a quasar, we would see radio emission from it squirting out, as it were, along the jet or, or making an angle, fixed angle with the jet. If we don't happen to lie in the, in the right direction, we won't see the radio emission. And that's one explanation of the fact that 
many quasars do not show radio emission. The fact is that they might, but that we don't see it. Whereas in the early days, it was thought they all did. Certainly our ideas have changed. But come on now, John, to the $64,000 question. How does a quasar work? Well, nowadays, there are lots of observations collected by many observers going towards answering this rather fascinating question. X-ray satellite data is available. Optical data, a great deal of optical data is available, radio data, and also now increasingly infrared data and uh, submillimeter observations obtained, for example, by the Preston QMC group using the United Kingdom Infrared Telescope on Hawaii at Mauna Kea. And the model which accounts for the sum total of these and the variability that I mentioned earlier and the immense power and the compactness, the model which seems to offer uh, the, the greatest prospect of success at any rate was one that was originally proposed by Lyndon Bell and elaborated by Hills in the 1970s, which is that, uh, that of, a, of, of a black hole. Yes, we hear so much about black holes these days, and I just wonder sometimes, you know, whether we're starting to regard black holes as remedies for everything we can't explain otherwise. That's as may be, but in this case, uh, it does seem that a black hole model uh, does explain most of the phenomena observed. According to that picture, according to that theoretical model, uh, what a quasar is, is in fact a galaxy at the center of which happens to lie a black hole. The energy is created by the descent into the black hole, a spiraling down of material, stars perhaps, and gas. If it's stars, then they must first of all be torn apart in order to be converted efficiently into, into electromagnetic energy. Now, according to this picture, uh, if the black hole is rather small, and they all would be at the beginning of the quasar's life, you could hardly detect the quasar because the amount of energy uh, being dissipated per unit time is really very small. On the other hand, if the black hole gets very big, as it eventually will do when the material has fallen into it, again, the quasar uh, doesn't appear because the field of the black hole, the gravitational field, is so large that the stars are eaten alive, as it were. They're <laughs> swallowed whole, and they are not uh, disrupted and converted into e electromagnetic radiation. So that between these two limits, when the black hole is of intermediate size, up to perhaps uh, 100 million times the mass of the sun, then the object emits tremendous quantities of radiation. Uh, the way of converting the, radi the, the mass into radiation is very efficient, although the exact mechanisms are not very well understood. And the efficiency can, can be as high as 10%, which is very great compared with the efficiencies of converting mass to energy in the middle of stars, which is always less than 1%. Yes, indeed. Now, uh, as well as accounting for the energy uh, production, this kind of picture also uh, accounts for the variability uh, uh, because uh, stars are not falling in at uniform rates. And there is a hope from pictures of this kind, there is a hope not yet fully realized, that it will be possible to calculate how powerful an individual quasar is. This, of course, is very important because it means that we'd be able to measure its distance. And if we can measure its distance, then a quasar acts as a tremendously precise probe of cosmological models, whether the universe is going to expand forever or whether it is going to come back again and collapse on itself in the so-called big crunch. And, of course, quasars being so bright allow us to see further and further back in time than, than, than anything else. Yeah. The furthest one yet known has a redshift of 3.85. Here it is. It was discovered uh, by Anne Savage uh, of the Royal Observatory, Edinburgh. And the theoretical picture that I've just sketched suggests that the majority of quasars ought to lie in a fairly restricted time zone uh, between redshifts uh, say two and three, some may be nearer, some are nearer, some may be a little further away, but that's where most of them would lie. And this shell of, of quasars allows us to probe backwards in time. This is a, a two-dimensional picture of, of a four-dimensional uh, universe. Yes. It only conveys very crudely the idea that we can look back in time when looking at quasars uh, to uh, as far away as 75% of, of the estimated current age of the universe. And uh, at the moment, uh, working on models of this kind, 
uh, a student working with me, Mark Kidger, who's making some interesting progress to try to probe how these models work. Well, it all seems to tie in, but is there any chance, you think, that there is some major mistake in the calculations and that the quasars aren't really nearly so far away as their redshifts indicate? There is a possibility, of course, and there is a small but convinced group of observers who take this extremely seriously. The leading one of these is Halton Arp, and he bases his ideas on the fact that he is able to measure certain quasars which are close to groups of other galaxies. The quasar may well be associated with the other galaxies, but its redshift is very different. And the conclusion he draws is that the redshift of the quasar must be due to something different. It can't be due to the expansion of the universe in that case. It must have a very special reason. And in that case, all the quasar redshifts might be the same, not due to the universal expansion. However, most of the evidence points in the other direction. And a, a very nice piece of observation done very recently by Shaver and Robinson shows extremely interesting data. They found that two quasars close to each other in pairs, um, one of which has a very large redshift and the other of which has a much smaller redshift. The narrow absorption lines uh, in the spectrum of the large redshift quasar have the same redshift as the small redshift quasar, but not the other way around. And this simply in implies that the further away a quasar is, the faster it's moving. And that, of course, is the cosmological picture of quasars. The fact is that they are participants in the universal expansion. And therefore, the simple and classical idea is not, at this point, seriously under threat. Quasars do seem to be cosmological. Yes, but of course, to some people, black holes may appear somewhat threatening. But I think it's fair to say, isn't it, that there's no chance at all of a major black hole or a quasar being within striking distance of our solar system. This is not observationally on. Uh, the gravitational field due to an object of this kind, particularly a large black hole, would, would be immense, and there's no sign of anything of the, uh, of the sort in the solar neighbourhood. And because all the quasars are a long way away, it does look as if there was certain one set time in the universe after it was created when bright quasars came along. Yes. Uh, Possibly all galaxies might have gone through a quasar phase. That's one of the things that the theoretical picture predicts. Maybe they all did. And in that case, there is a prediction of how many quasars there would be in the universe. And that's something that can also be tested by observation. And I wonder what the total is. Well, uh, it's not clear. Perhaps uh, a few hundred thousand, perhaps a million. This, of course, is not very, very clearly predicted. But at least it does seem that instead of being rare objects, as were thought originally, quasars are probably very common indeed in our, in, our, in our universe. They may well be, and certainly more and more are being discovered and measured all the time. Well, thank you very much, John. So we can see that at the present moment, we have to admit that there's a great deal that we don't know. Quasars only came along in 1963. Before that, they were not only unknown, they were unsuspected. But they've turned out to be of immense importance. And because they lie apparently fairly close to the boundary of the observable universe, they're going to tell us a great deal more, I think, in the foreseeable future. So, for the moment, from John and myself, good night. That programme on quasars will be shown again over on BBC Two on Saturday afternoon at 5.15. And the next edition of The Sky at Night can be observed here on BBC One Scotland on Sunday the 4th of September. <laughs>